Welcome to Hydrogen Rising, a bi-weekly podcast created and hosted by the global law firm k Gates that brings you analysis of critical, cutting-edge issues impacting the global hydrogen market. We look forward to your engagement and feedback. And of course, don't hesitate to reach out if you have ideas about new topics you'd like us to cover. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 11 of Hydrogen Rising. Very excited to have everyone back for another exciting discussion in the world of hydrogen. We are excited today to be joined by our partner, Buck Endeman, who resides in our San Francisco, California office. Buck's practice really is at the intersection of energy and the environment and particular focus in the renewable energy sector, developing, buying, selling renewable energy projects. Heavy focus, I think, on the Western United States and given his location in California with a a particular focus there in, in that state. And of course, California is at least in the United States, really the leading market for hydrogen and setting a number of the standards. So we're excited to have Buck join and and add to the discussion. So welcome, Buck. Hey, thanks a lot, David. I appreciate the introduction. And you're right, being California trained attorney the last dozen years or so, California has been an early mover on a lot of climate-friendly technologies, and they sometimes get it right, and they sometimes get it wrong, but you can always say that you get a lot of looks being in, in California. That's great. So let's dive right in on hydrogen. I mean, I you know I think most of our listeners are probably aware that California really is leading the U.S. market uh, in terms of hydrogen opportunities and development, but can you give us just kind of a quick lay of the land right now on how you see hydrogen in California? Yeah, absolutely. In California, my view is that we can separate the various hydrogen efforts or incentives really into two buckets. The first we'll call bucket one, and that's existing clean transportation policies that just happen to include hydrogen as a fuel or or, or a feedstock, but they're wrapped in with all sorts of other things. And then there's bucket two, and these are new environmental policies or new clean energy policies that are starting to recognize the specific attributes of hydrogen that make it a pretty attractive fuel where it can make a significant impact on its own towards California's climate policies. I like that kind of orientation. And and I think that bucket one and bucket two, we see that at the federal level as well. So it's not surprising to hear you talk about that. Let's focus on bucket one for a minute. Um, I think in January, California Governor Gavin Newsom proposed to allocate about a billion and a half U.S. uh, to the construction and maintenance of charging stations and hydrogen fueling infrastructure as part of the overall stimulus proposal, the state budget stimulus proposal. Can you give us a bit more details on that billion and a half dollars that that is, is you know, hopefully being appropriated for, uh, I guess, clean fuel, essentially, for transportation? Absolutely. And for our California listeners, I guess I'll give a quick disclaimer at first, and that is we're talking about buckets one and buckets two. And to be clear, we aren't talking about the bucket one, two, and three rec program for our RPS goals. So maybe in my preparation, I can think of a better way to characterize things. But that notwithstanding, let's talk a little bit about Governor Newsom's proposed $1.5 billion he wants to put towards um, clean transportation programs. So CARB, uh, which is the California Air Resources Board and the CEC, or the California Energy Commission, have for many, many years offered really significant rebates and grant funding and other goodies for zero emission vehicles. R&D funding, uh, air district by air district grants. There's been a lot of effort out there where CARB and the local air districts have thought, what are some ways we can get either better performing engines on our road or, or cut out the emissions entirely. And while those programs do include some carves out or carve outs or some directives for uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, hydrogen really is just one of several fuels that are eligible under those transportation focused programs. Things like EVs and, and CNG, uh, other feedstocks or other fuels are all eligible. And um, over the last couple of years, hydrogen's done okay under those programs. We have seen Uh, a couple of dozen hydrogen fueling stations in California, but it really hasn't fared or it hasn't garnered the attention that other uh, technologies for transportation have. We see a major emphasis on battery electric and CNG, 
uh, particularly CNG derived from renewable natural gas sources, those continue to capture the lion's share of the CARB and CEC and local air district incentives. And you know, why is that? Well, they're incumbent technologies, and particularly for battery electric, there are really strong forces of consumer demand starting mm. to work here. You know, everyone wants a Tesla, and there's a sense of familiarity with the te- technology and also the infrastructure. It's making those technologies a little bit cheaper and more popular. Even if, David, in some circumstances, hydrogen really is the more carbon-friendly fuel. It's just not top of mind for folks. So that billion and a half announced by Governor Newsom, it is rolled in with those bucket one types of transportation programs, really anything that's zero emission vehicle. I've been fortunate for the last couple of years to serve on the board of the Center for Sustainable Energy, uh, which administers clean transport programs uh, across several states, including California. And in my experience, if you don't have government money specifically tagged for research and development grants, the bulk of things like development and construction money is going to go to more mature consumer facing technologies that are a little bit easier to scale and sell. And David, you yeah. understand this as well. And it means when the CEC makes a decision to fund a particular technology or take a particular approach, there's less egg on their face if that particular technology uh, doesn't, doesn't exactly yeah, there has some, some bumps in the road. Yeah. I, that, I think that that absolutely makes sense. And, and certainly, you know, there are notable, when you look at federal programs, there are some notable high profile failures back in the Obama administration, of course, that really, I think, set the DOE programs back in terms of their ability to provide funding for alternative clean energy technologies. So that makes a ton of sense. Since we're focused on uh, transportation right now, let me ask you about California's low carbon fuel standard which, as I understand it, functions as a, a, essentially a carbon credit program, allowing for the trading of those, those carbon emission credits. For our regular listeners, folks will remember that in our last episode with our guest Alex Classig from IHS Market, uh, Alex briefly mentioned the LCFS, suggesting that it, it really could be a very effective uh, mechanism for hydrogen because it measures or classifies the carbon intensity uh, of the fuel as opposed to kind of just a, a, a broader generic categorization like a renew- some renewable fuel standards, for example. And I guess as an energy projects lawyer and environmental lawyer in California, interested to, to get your views on the LCFS and particularly its intersection with hydrogen. It's a really good question. Alex is absolutely correct in that under the California GREET model, which is a big, complicated spreadsheet that you use, you have to plug in essentially every aspect of your product from building it to transporting the commodity under it. Really, anything that has a carbon footprint, you derive a broad carbon intensity score for your fuel feedstock. And it's it's a complicated model. And if, if done I will say if done correctly, but if done advantageously, green hydrogen that's produced with renewable energy, perhaps using locally sourced water, it's being used in the very near vicinity to displace a higher carbon fuel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, that, that could generate a super low uh, CI score. But th- that's not always the case here. According to information published by CARB, we have seen hydrogen carbon intensities that have been published, and they range from about negative 125 to about 80, uh, with many of the hydrogen projects generating carbon intensity scores similar to ethanol in the 30 to to 80 range. So so, so, so hydrogen, uh, granted, many of those hydrogen projects are probably not as optimized as, as they could be. And there's are good scores, but they're not great scores. I mean, let's, let's compare it to, say, uh, renewable, electric, uh, renewable electricity sent to charging stations might have a carbon intensity of zero. Uh, for mm-hmm. various policy and technical reasons, dairy gas gets a very favorable CI score, sometimes as low as, as negative 350. So when you're comparing these, these other types of fuels to hydrogen, I do think there's the opportunity for hydrogen to to generate a very low, a really smoke and really attractive CI score. But all those circumstances have to be to be to be right here. So, you know, if we're looking at LCFS to spur hydrogen development in California, it might play a role, but it might not be the primary driver. Because even if you do generate green hydrogen, you still got to. You still need a hydrogen vehicle to put it in to generate the credit. You need that fueling infrastructure. You need to transport it. You need to store it. You need to do all these things. And all of those incremental steps under LCFS 
add a couple of ticks to that carbon intensity score, and more importantly, add dollars to a project if you don't have existing infrastructure in place. So, you know, we're comparing things to other fuel sources like electricity and CNG. Uh, those are going to be much cheaper and uh, and generate uh, probably better CI scores. So, you know, we just got to remember this LCFS program. It's 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 great for many things. But at heart, it's a transportation fuel program, and it's not going to help decarbonize other uses like cooking, heating, industrial processes, or you know, generating electricity or for storing energy. Um, and it's in those, those types of use cases where hydrogen really does have certain advantages compared to those other feedstocks. So I think that's helpful. We've been quite conscious, I think, most recently in particular about the heavy focus on the transportation industry and, and the need to really be thinking about other demand drivers for hydrogen. I think in particular heat intensive industries, you think about, about manufacturing and steel manufacturing in particular and the like. We really need to be, um, I think, particularly in the United States, focusing on that. At least that's, that's my opinion. You know, with that in mind, let's step out of transportation a bit. Talk about bucket two, uh, as as you called it, which would be things that are are more intently focused on hydrogen, more opportunities, and I guess um, the the planning processes that California regulators um, and policymakers use. Do you anticipate going forward that? hydrogen will begin to play a larger role in uh, kind of the, the, the planning that I know the California Energy Commission and the Utility Commission undertake on an annual basis or kind of every couple of years. Do you expect hydrogen is, is going to play a, a more prominent role? Yes, it will, David. In fact, it's already playing a, a, an outsized role relative to its maturity and acceptance as a commercial technology. And that's what's so exciting about the space out here in California is that is, is, it's already got some level of, of if not regulatory buy-in, some level of re- regulatory acknowledgement and support. So, uh, as you know, the CEC and the, and the CPUC, the California Public Utilities Commission, they're tasked with energy planning within California. And that job or their job has gotten a lot harder the last 20 years or so. And first, our energy supply is, is, is for the most part, cheaper and more abundant, but it is less predictable. That's largely due to the proliferation of wind and solar. And those cheap, easy wind and solar electrons have edged out more expensive, but also more predictable forms of generation out of the market. I mean, you know, coal is one thing, but even natural gas plants are having a tough time remaining competitive when competing with with abundant midday wind and solar. We also have a lot of rooftop solar in California, which leads to reliability concerns. The, the grid operator has a tough time. It just, it just doesn't have a great sense of every rooftop on California and what that rooftop is doing at any particular time. So uh, th- th- there's some technical changes afoot in California. The second big thing is our summers are hotter, drier, and longer. Our winters are shorter. We get less rain. That's really extended the wildfire season. And utilities are routinely holding these public service power shutoffs, and they're they're shutting down entire transmission and distribution corridors. So, when, you know, if it's really windy, the lines don't get knocked down and start forest fires. So there's really a very general awareness here that our climate is changing and that policymakers want to take every opportunity that they can to displace fossil generation, which they mm-hmm. see as contributing and, 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 and even accelerating those, those, uh, those uh, climate changes. Oh, and they want to replace it with something cleaner. So the two factors, more abundant but less predictable energy, and two, changing weather, are causing Californians to look at ways where we can take the disadvantages of one to solve the problems caused by two. So how can we how can we soak up this excess midday wind and solar in periods of abundance and store it for use when the wind isn't blowing, the sun isn't out? And, and that's where the state is and the CPUC and CEC are specifically looking at hydrogen and betting that it might be able to play an outsized role here. So, you know, we're starting to see some green shoots. Uh, in actual project development, LADWP is converting the Intermountain Power Plant. LADWP is the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, and I believe it's the nation's largest municipal utility and plays a large role throughout the American Southwest in its 
uh, power procurement and policy decision making. So uh, for years, it operated the Intermountain Power Plant in Utah. I think it, it, it owned it or had had a majority interest in it, uh, which burned coal and transported that coal generated power many hundreds of miles across transmission lines uh, to serve the residents of Los Angeles. Um, uh, coal has fallen out of favor in California and uh, in many Western states. And uh, LADWP was faced with a tough decision. What do we do with this asset that is expected to operate a couple more years, but, but people just don't want coal-fired electricity? So what they're doing is converting that 1,800 megawatts of coal into eight or 900 megawatts of, wow. uh, of, of hydrogen-powered electricity. <laughs> They'll store that hydrogen in underground salt caverns that are nearby. So again, the project is very uh, fortuitously sited. And there's already a lot of transmission there. It's not going to go to waste. They can still get that power into California. Um, the Intermountain Project also has some other uh, perks that are becoming increasingly relevant in environmental and energy decision making and policy making. That is social equity. Um, uh, for years, the little town of Delta, Utah, has been a, a, a company town for Intermountain. And mm -hmm. Intermountain's provided a lot of support uh, to that town. And it's an important part of that town's culture. Uh, now, uh, rather than just pick up, close the coal plant down and leave, this does allow LADWP and its partners to continue to play a role uh, and continue to support that community. So that's that's that, that that's, that's a good thing. So so interesting. A quick point on that. Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia, of course, second largest coal producing state in the United States and now chair of the Senate Energy Committee and the swing vote really in, in an evenly divided Senate, I think has has to his credit articulated uh, impacts on coal communities quite well, noting that they 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 feel a bit like veterans returning from war and and kind of a lack of support. And so I think this example you've given in in Utah of the Intermountain Power Plant is really fascinating because it is a commitment to converting a community that has relied on a resource that is no longer the favored resource that that we know we can can produce and you know we can we can produce power in more environmentally responsible manners and and yet we're still committed to that community and helping that transition in that community. So just in, you know, you don't have to necessarily comment on that, but I think it's a great example and it's an example that we need to be replicating in some form or fashion around the country as other communities, whether it's oil or coal or natural gas, begin the energy transition and face similar situations. It's a great point you make, and obviously I, I wasn't smart enough to be an engineer, so I went to law school. But <laughs> it, it seems to me that the the transition from a say a coal fire generator to a hydrogen or gas power generator would be a, 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 an easier leap in terms of a skill set, in terms of someone that could take skills learned over a over a career working at a power generation using one source of feedstock and then going to another. Whereas Senator Manchin and others may have a stronger case to say, how are we going to retrain you know, coal miners to be solar electricians or, or yeah. wind turbine manufacturers? So you're right. It does seem that if we're keeping the, the type of generation, the thermal generation using a, a synchronous unit, um, there could be an easier job in terms of taking you know, very solid technical jobs from uh, the, the old economy and bringing those into the new economy. So that's, I view that as a real win for this project, frankly. Uh, but again, it's it's fortuitously cited. It's in Utah. Uh, there's an easy and cheap place to store the hydrogen uh, that's close by. There's also a lot of wind power in the area too. So you'll have plenty of green energy necessary to, to create the hydrogen. You know, hydrogen also takes a lot of water. I'm not entirely sure what the water situation is out there, but uh, uh, the point is it's a, uh, from all accounts, it's a, it's a very successful a project both for uh, climate advocates, uh, for jobs advocates, and uh, and for people that are interested in preserving uh, the way of life of a community. So it's it, it's good. So uh, and that's that's a high profile, large scale exercise of how California is looking at hydrogen. We're starting to see smaller pilot projects too by the utilities in California, where mm. hydrogen can act as really a long duration storage technology. Uh, to compete with lithium ion batteries. There is a law in California passed about five years ago that requires California ut uh, utilities to pur purchase a significant amount of, uh, of energy storage, uh, long-term energy storage. And batteries have been the preferred solution 
pretty much all along, and they're good for about four hours of discharge. But you know, given these extreme afternoon ramps or the 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 amount of power you have to spool up in a, in a relatively short amount of time for spring and summer here in California, there really is a, a dire need for better and longer lasting storage technologies and even some seasonal storage uh, to get us through shorter winter days or even shorter winter weeks where, where you might have lulls in wind and solar production. So, you know, hydrogen is viewed as a storage medium because it's relatively easy to store. It's relatively easy to convert back into into power. So you know, each of these technologies, you know, batteries, hydrogen, et cetera, they all have their pluses and minuses. I mean, there's not like a silver bullet thing out there that's going to make everyone happy all the time. Uh, but in terms of a, a long duration storage technology, I mean, David, anyone with a cell phone knows you'd rather have two weeks of charge remaining rather than, uh, you know, measly four hours. So we're hoping hydrogen can uh, <laughs> can give Californians a, a bit of a better sense and, 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 and of that range anxiety. So Getting back to your initial question of how are, how are these agencies looking at hydrogen, there's actually a, what's called a high hydrogen scenario in the, the CEC's most recent uh, integrated energy report, where uh, they're, they're feeling that by 2045, yes, hydrogen is going to require to be produced in an environmentally responsible manner, a ton of new renewable energy development. Um, but the advantages of using hydrogen as a storage medium would allow it to displace you know, peaker plants and even some biofuels. So hmm. even by 2045, it's still looking pretty expensive at a 126 bucks per megawatt hour. So, huh. you know, that's that's still a ways in the future. And it is safe to say, though, that the, the state's taking a real serious look at, at whether a hydrogen economy can help California power towards a carbon free future. That's great. But the kind of cost estimate, it's, you know, it's interesting. I think you and I have both been in the energy sector now long enough to have seen various waves in various sectors. You know, we remember when solar was too expensive. We remember when shale gas was too expensive. And the fact is the industry adapts, adopts, creates quite quickly as a whole, right? The energy industry. And I think I see a lot of the same predictions you see about 2040, but it sure feels like the hydrogen economy is going to move a lot more quickly than that. And, and you know, who's to say that there couldn't be two or three catalyst type events right in in the market whether it's a new technology whether you know something something else that shifts things in such a way that it moves much quicker than 2040 so i think time time will tell but but obviously california will will be at the helm We'll leave it there, Buck. Really appreciate your time and your insights today. Uh, we're excited to have one of our California folks on the podcast. If anyone has any questions related to hydrogen in California, you can certainly find our partner, Buck Endeman on our website at kalegates.com. Uh, encourage all of you to check out our hydrogen handbook, which is a global resource that our team from all across the world put together, including Buck was involved in that. And until the next time, hope you have a great two weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode of Hydrogen Rising. Be sure to subscribe to receive timely notifications of future episodes and check out our market-leading publication, The Hydrogen Handbook, on our website at www.klgates.com.